Hello everyone, how are you going? Welcome to First European Settlers in Canada, something that I know is in the single side of the story even just looking at Canada today and so I'm wondering where does everyone else's influence come in? Welcome to History Class. Today's video will be about the first European settlers in the territory of the present day Canada. Hmm. Here you will see from which countries they came and when they set up the first permanent settlements. Perfect. The first Europeans arrived in present-day Canada as early as the 10th and 11th century, oh, when West Norse wow. sailors explored and briefly settled limited areas on its eastern shores. Yes. The Norse, who had settled Greenland and Iceland, arrived around the year 1000 and built a small settlement at Lance aux Meduse, at the northernmost tip of Newfoundland. Wow. Carbon dating estimates this between the years 990 and 1050. <laughs> That is pretty insane. I mean, I know that the Norse and the Vikings are just renowned for their ability in their boats and all those kind of things, but to make a journey like they showed is pretty ridiculous. Look at that, just all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. And it isn't as though they are sailing across in the Caribbean, you know, you have some serious conditions and if not just some icebergs and things that you're going to be encountering up near Iceland and Greenland and then eventually settling up in the north of Canada. I mean, I know through legend and even just where they came from that they were already fairly used to a cold and climatized to those kind of conditions, but my my goodness, just sailing, like I said, across the Atlantic in, I can only assume any time of the year, actually, maybe they're actually smart enough to only travel in the summer, so they're not going to be encountering as much ice. And to be honest, looking at how north they are, I can only imagine they would have had to have traveled into the summer to be able to even get up there via boat and not have to trek it across the ice. I mean, it would be kind of a rude shock, even though, like I said, they would have been used to it or at least expecting it just to be going from green grass covered houses to all of a sudden, I don't know, three meters under snow. Carbon dating estimate this between the years 990 and 1050. Lonzo Meduse is also notable for its connection with the attempted colony of Vinland, established by Leif Erikson around the same period, wow. or more broadly with Norse exploration of the Americas. Mm. According to Icelandic sagas, violent conflicts with the indigenous population were the reasons for the Norse to abandon these settlements. Yeah, right. Under letters patent from King Henry VII of England, the Italian Giovanni Caboto or John Cabot became the first European known to have landed in Canada after yeah. the time of the Vikings. Oh, so there was 500 years between the two, which truly shows you how far in advance the Norse were, you know, to be able to, like I said, travel across the Atlantic into basically a rowboat, but a very, very good rowboat, and then 500 years later, everyone else coming up and going, hang on a second, this is actually some pretty good stuff, why don't we stay here, or at least attempt to? And so I guess from the Norse perspective, it's a shame that they were driven out by the local battles that they had, because, well, they were definitely onto something. Records indicate that on the 24th of June, 1497, he sighted land at a northern location believed to be somewhere in the Atlantic provinces. Official tradition deemed the first landing site to be at Cap Bonavista, Newfoundland, yeah. although other locations are possible. After 1497, Cabot and his son, Sebastian Cabot, continued to make other voyages to find the Northwest Passage. Hang on a second, I need to take that back because I don't think I've ever seen a father and son that looks so similar. Like, if you told me that was the same portrait with a different filter on it, I'd go, okay, fair enough, let alone that is two separate people. But hey, in terms of the actual voyage itself, it definitely makes sense that I think virtually everyone from Europe is going to be running into Newfoundland first. You know, I'm sure maybe if the Spaniards went a little bit more south, they're going to be running into, honestly, close to the USA. As we can see here, it is just so much further out than anything else. And like I said, the USA border is right there. And so, yeah, unless they're going up and over or even running into Greenland and Iceland somehow, it is definitely going to be the first thing for anyone out of Europe just going straight across. Look at that, directly in line with London, Paris, even just coming in from anywhere in Italy and all those places. If they come straight out, they're definitely going to be running into either the USA like Miami and that or up in Newfoundland. Cabot and his son, Sebastian Cabot, continued to make other voyages to find the Northwest Passage. Other see. explorers continued to sail out of England to the New World, there although the details of these voyages are not well recorded. The Spanish crown claimed it had territorial rights in the area visited by John Cabot in 1497 and 1498, based on the Treaty of Tordesillas. However, Portuguese explorers like Joao Fernandes Labrador would continue to visit the North Atlantic coast, which accounts for the appearance of Labrador on topographical maps of the period. Wow. There is clearly a lot going on here, and to be honest, there is a lot also going over my head, especially when he started talking about the treaty, you know, I'm not too sure how to pronounce that, I don't really want to butcher it, but there is a lot of information in this entire map here, you know, and I will be the first to admit that my history on Spain and Portugal is definitely a bit below par, but I really still have then have no idea how the line of Pope Alexander VI comes into any of this entire thing, and I am also wondering if the Red Treaty of Saragossa is just overruling this first treaty, or is it just an expansion of 19, no, not 19, 1494. 
In 1501 and 1502, the Corci Real brothers explored Newfoundland or Terra Nova and Labrador, claiming these lands as part of the Portuguese Empire. In 1506, King Manuel I of Portugal created taxes for the cod fisheries in Newfoundland waters. Wait, what? Created taxes? Wait, what? Manuel I of Portugal created taxes for the cod fisheries in Newfoundland waters. I'm hearing created taxes for the fishermen's use in Newfoundland waters, which just sounds insane. Like, why are you taxing someone that is across the entire other side of the Atlantic? I mean, I know you want to be taking the money, but seriously? I mean, to be fair, there would have been so much untouched nature up in there that honestly, just picking a fish out of the sea, same as I guess Sydney Harbour, just would have been so easy. You just throw a line in there to just pull it out immediately and a fish is going to bite. I mean, in that regard, the Europeans are certainly very good at just taking all the fish out of the sea, leaving none for anyone else. And then that's how we're in this, what we are now. But my goodness, to even just be imposing taxes on that entire thing, like I said, across the other side of the entire ocean. Especially when you don't even truly own the land, you're just kind of claiming it because you were there first, and I mean, I guess that is basically how all of history has been run, but then at the same time, it is just a very, very heavy assumption. João Alvarez Fagunges and Pedro G. Barcelos established fishing outposts in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia around 1521. Right. However, these were later abandoned, with the Portuguese colonizers focusing their efforts on South America. French interest in the New World began with Francis I of France, who in 1524 sponsored Giovanni da Verrazzano to navigate the region between Florida and Newfoundland, in hopes of finding a route to the Pacific Ocean. In 1534, Jacques Cartier planted a cross in the Gaspé Peninsula and claimed the land in the name of Francis I. Wow, well I was certainly wondering what was going to be happening in terms of the French or the British because clearly we know how history has turned out so far but all we were hearing about was the Spanish and the Portuguese and so you're going, hang on a second, should Canada actually be tying its roots back to the Portuguese and the Spaniards? But I guess they just kind of after a while in the same way that the Norse did just gave up and got chased out or even just left in general. I mean it also does make me wonder how much of this is word of mouth, you know, the King of France hears from the King of Spain or the King of Portugal or whatever it may be, just hang on a second, do you know there's a bit of a place over across the sea? and they go, ooh, and, oh, and you're leaving, are you? Good to know, and then I'll just sneak on in. Cartier heard two captured guides speak the Iroquoian word Kanata, meaning village. And by the 1550s, the name of Canada began appearing on maps. Earlier colonization attempts by Cartier at Charlesburg Royal in 1541, at Sable Island in 1598 by Marquis de la roche Meguet, and at Tadoussac, Quebec, in 1600 by François Gravé Dupont had failed. Wow. Despite these initial failures, French fishing fleets began to sail to the Atlantic coast and into the St. Lawrence River, trading and making alliances with First Nations. I want to take it back to where they were talking about just the tiny island, yes, Sable Island. How do you fail at setting up something there? Like, is there a whole bundle of people that live on Sable Island that were able to drive them off? Surely not. I mean, you're the French, we're going to say, coming over with your big ships. Surely there is no presence on that island that would have been able to stand up to a single ship's worth of anything. But hey, I guess if you fail because you get wiped out because of a tsunami or something? I mean, at least the history doesn't only speak of warring and events like that. You know, they were able to establish some kind of a trading route and just get furs and pelts and I don't really know what the French would have been selling but maybe they were only buying those kind of things. Either way it's not as though everyone was just out for blood all the time even though through looking at European history there definitely would have been a hint of that in the back of their mind or maybe more than a hint. England has its own attempts to establish a permanent settlement in present-day Canada. The English led by Humphrey Gilbert had claimed St. John's Newfoundland in 1583 as the first North American English colony by the royal prerogative of Queen Elizabeth I. <laughs> In the reign of King James I, the English established additional colonies in Cupids and Fairyland, Newfoundland, and soon after established the first successful permanent settlements of Virginia to the south. I think what makes me laugh the most about this entire thing is the fact that Newfoundland is just getting found over and over and over again, and yes, these are the people that are coming from the UK, and they don't know truly how big this is, but if we look at maps and you see how big that entire island is, and like I said, yes, you've got the UK, but look at the rest of the amount of land that they could have found or were kind of finding, but not utilizing, they were all just setting up shop, like what, within 50 or 100 kilometers of one another, just going, okay, this is France's and this is Spain's and this is the British, as really guys, you could have spread out and had a bit more of an individualized colonial system, maybe even multiple countries could have existed up here, but no, it now all belongs to one, and all because you guys got, I don't know, too greedy or maybe just a little bit too scared. In 1604, a North American fur trade monopoly was granted to Pierre Dubois, Sieur du Mons. The fur trade became one of the main economic ventures in North America. Crazy. Dubois led his first colonization expedition to an island located near the mount of the San Croix River. Among his lieutenants was a geographer named Samuel de Champlain who promptly carried out a major exploration of the northeastern coastline of what is now the United States. 
In the spring of 1605, under Samuel de Champlain, the new St. Croix settlement was moved to Port Royal. This was the France's first successful settlement in North America. Can you imagine coming over from Europe, wherever you might have been, and then just venturing into the Bay of Fundy not knowing what you were in for, you know, just having a 10 to 12 to 15 metre tide, you know, you would get stuck if you go too far down, and then within the hour you'll be just dredged on the bottom of the floor. I mean, I guess to be fair, if you were smart about it, you wouldn't probably panic too much considering you have plenty of experience with water, and so you know about the tides, and so you go, hang on a second, that's a quick tide, and so if we just give it another half an hour, I swear it'll be back again. But no, like they were saying, they were just sending guys all over the place just in ships of all sizes I can only imagine just to explore the entire coastline. I mean, they were nowhere near exploring the western coastline and that's an entire different ball game. But when you were starting off all the way up in Canada and then eventually getting down to the USA's coastline, you were definitely covering some serious ground. And look, don't even get me started on the fur trade monopoly because that would have been an absolutely ridiculous contract. I don't even know how you go about kind of winning that thing in the first place. You know, all of a sudden you're just basically a billionaire. But my goodness, we know the volume that was just getting pumped out of Canada in the fur trade business and my goodness the amount of animals that would have just met their end in that time oh unimaginable this was the france's first successful settlement in north america yeah. port royal served as the capital of acadia until its destruction by british military forces in 1613. france relocated the settlement and capital eight kilometers upstream and to the south bank of the annapolis river the site Why? of the present day town of annapolis royal on the 3rd of that? july 1608 champlain founded what is now quebec city probably the earliest permanent settlement in present-day Canada, which will become the capital of New France. Champlain, also called the father of New France, served as its administrator for the rest of his life. In the following years, the French colonies in Canada reached a few hundred inhabitants, but the British colonies in the south eventually became richer and more populous leading to conflicts in the following decades between these two European powers. Yeah, why is that though? Why were the British all of a sudden just bigger, better and badder than their bigger brother the French? You know, the French were their first for goodness sake. They had more colonies, or I guess some of the first colonies, and I mean, yes, they got attacked and then they moved eight kilometers upstream, which like I said, I have no idea why you would even bother in the first place. It's only 8K. They can definitely find you again if they really want to just be destroying it again. I mean, maybe it just comes down to the fact that the British were sending more resources over, be it money or resources or people, over to establish these colonies and the French were kind of just taking the money and running back home. I mean, to be fair, I would love to know how much of Canada had just been explored, you know, like I was saying, they'd only just basically stuck to one island because that is all they knew. One island, that must be the entire world, even though you've just crossed the entire Atlantic. I think you should know that there might be bigger things out there. I mean, if nothing else, at least I finally got my question answered in terms of where do the French and the British influences come from? And seeing as Quebec City was one of the first ones set up, I can understand why it is such a big deal these days. And so it is pretty incredible how much Canada shows us that history is written by the winners, you know. I could certainly be sitting here saying that all of Canada is just speaking either Portuguese or Spanish and that would be totally understandable as well. And so to be honest, I think it would be an incredible experience just to have this entire time period laid out in front of you just from a fly on the walls perspective, you know. You see a thousand years ago the Norse come and then they leave and they get driven out and then 500 years after that everyone else is arriving and then it just explodes. It would be absolutely insane just to see how busy and how quickly it got busy. But anyway, insane that I reckon and I'm going to call it there. So thank you for watching this video. If you did enjoy it, feel free to do the YouTube algorithmic things down below. Also, if this is the first video of mine that you were watching, then make sure to go check out any other ones I've done. Also, make sure to go check out the original video down in the description below. Or hey, maybe you even just want to consider subscribing so that you don't miss another one of these in the future. But all in all, have a good one and see ya.